So I, I don't have a personal relationship to Ukraine in the normal sense, but I will say that as a historian, trying to understand the Soviet Union and Soviet terror, trying to understand the Second World War and German terror, or for that matter, trying to understand the strengths and weaknesses of contemporary European integration, there's no more important place than Ukraine. And so I've learned the Ukrainian language. I've made Ukrainian friends. I've spent a good deal of time in Ukraine, but not because I'm personally connected to it, but because I'm sure that without understanding Ukraine, we can't understand European history and we're not going to get the European future right either. So when we think about history, uh, we think about history nationally, whether we're American or German or Russian or Ukrainian, we start from ourselves and often we get no further than that. But to understand the truly important moments of history, one has to start with humanity. So what I do in Bloodlands is I don't start from Jewish or Ukrainian or Belarusian or Russian or Polish or German history. I start from the basic fact that 14 million children, women and men were murdered for political reasons on a very small part of Europe over a very short period of time. It so happens that the place where the Holocaust took place is the same place where a number of other German and Soviet killing policies took place. It so happens that that zone of Europe between Berlin and Moscow is also the zone of Europe which is touched by both German and Soviet policy. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to explain this enormous political atrocity, which involves Germany, which involves the Soviet Union, but which involves above all human beings. If we take care you know, to account for all of the human beings, then we see all of the policies. And the things we think we know, like the Holocaust, are easier to understand. Tragedies that we don't know about, like perhaps the famine in Ukraine, come forth. The, the German understanding of the Second World War is, is largely the West German understanding of the Second World War. And the West German understanding of the Second World War arose behind the Iron Curtain. So German crimes came to be familiar and were discussed in the 1970s and 1980s. But even the crimes that were most discussed, like the Holocaust, were discussed in a minimal way with reference to German Jews, who were a very small victim group, with reference to the camps, which is not where the Holocaust actually took place. To understand the Holocaust, one has to be able to understand German colonialism, the German invasion of Eastern Europe, which is where the Jews actually lived in Poland and in the Western Soviet Union. Um, and so the bloodlands uh, are necessary even for the most basic German crime to be understood. Once we're there, we begin to see other things, like the German starvation of Soviet prisoners of war, which have been almost completely overlooked. So it's, this is true, I think, for every nation as it grows great, as it becomes important, as it becomes more self-conscious. The continental history, the world history, have to come in. Too many Germans still think of the Second World War in a kind of provincial way. The more that Germans understand it as a European and as a global conflict, I think the better, the, the better they'll understand themselves and the more useful they'll be to others. So let me begin by saying what those traumatic experiences were. Um, Ukraine, in many ways, has a pretty typical European history until the beginning of the 20th century. It has romanticism, it has national uprisings, it has multiple attempts to establish a national state after 1918 and the end of the First World War. Where your Ukrainian history becomes different is in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, where Ukraine becomes part of, first, the attempt to establish um, a radically new kind of politics, the Soviet Union, and second, becomes a victim of German colonial policy and the attempt to enslave Ukrainians and extract resources. Ukraine then is unique as the only big country in Europe which is subject to a kind of double colonization. As a result, something like three and a half million inhabitants of Soviet Ukraine are killed as a matter of Soviet policy in the 1930s, and then another three and a half million Ukrainians, roughly half of them Jews, 
are killed as a result of German policy in the 1940s. There is no comparable European tragedy on a territory. Ukraine is the most dangerous place to live, not only in Europe, but in the world between 1933 and 1945. Obviously, this has consequences. One of them, of course, is distrust. Um, the Holocaust or a, the Soviet famine are events in which neighbors treated neighbors badly. It's not just a matter of power coming from the outside. And that leaves a legacy of distrust. Another major legacy is the problem of the elite. It, was, it would always be the bureaucrats or the middle classes or the people who had shown themselves capable of doing things that would be targeted first in various kinds of terror. It takes a while for a nation to recover itself from that. So the Ukraine that's emerging now, um, is a, despite all of its troubles, despite the, the Russian invasion, despite the terrible problems of oligarchy and corruption, this is the Ukraine which has been least touched by violence in its modern history. It's the Ukraine which is the most European in the sense of an aspiration towards what they call normality and, and towards the rule of law. Um, this is the Ukraine, I think, that has the best chance, but Europeans have to also to give them that chance. Well, I mean, what people would expect a historian to say is that in Russia, it's, uh, it's all simple, in Ukraine, it's complicated. And that's true to some extent. In Ukraine, you have two different discourses, one of Ukrainian nationalists who fought against the Soviet Union, and the, the major narrative, uh, which is of Ukrainian veterans of the Red Army who fought in the Soviet armed forces. Um, whereas in Russia, you only have the Red Army story. But that's not really the difference. The, the difference is actually something more profound. For Russians, the Second World War is mainly something that happened beyond Russia. Sure, there was the terrible catastrophe of the Siege of Leningrad. There was the unbelievably bloody battle for Stalingrad. But for most Russians, the heroism of the Second World War involves going beyond Russia into other places all the way to Berlin. For Ukrainians, on the other hand, the Second World War is above all something that happened here. All of Ukraine was occupied for a very long time by the Germans, which meant that a very large number of Ukrainian civilians were killed. An absolute number is a higher number than Russian civilians. So for Ukrainians, the war is also something to be proud of. Ukrainian soldiers also fought their way to Berlin. The military formation of the Red Army, which arrived in Berlin, was actually called the Ukrainian Front. But, but, but above all, it's something else. The war was a tragedy at the end of a, of a whole series of other tragedies. Famine and terror and then German invasion. The war was something that happened here. That's the basic difference between Russia and Ukraine and narrative and memory. And it's the reason why I think Russians can look on an invasion of Crimea or military action in Syria as a kind of heroism. Whereas for Ukrainians, the Russian invasion of their country is just more suffering, just more senseless suffering. There's nothing, there's nothing heroic about invading another country, I think, from the basic Ukrainian point of view.